Dr. James Thompson at the University of Wisconsin was the first one to grow successfully human embryonic stem cells in the lab back in 1998. So you might call him Mr. Human Embryonic Stem Cell. He's at least been honest in talking about the real science involved. And he said scientists have overestimated the prospects for transplantation cures using embryonic stem cells. A lot of hype out there. And he was willing to admit that. What's he actually doing in his research? He's uh, looking at basic drug discovery and testing in the lab. In fact, he's even switched over to a different type of stem cell than the embryonic. We'll mention that in just a little bit. So the question comes up, well, you know, if this guy is sort of giving up on the idea of cures or whatever and embryonic stem cells, why do people keep pushing? Well, this Harvard scientist, Kevin Egan, may have said it best, states will pour more money into this research and we'll all get more money. Certainly money factors in here. I do want to mention just briefly this whole idea about the frozen embryos being used, the so-called thrown away embryos. In my country, there's no regulation whatever on the IVF industry. So they make a tremendous number of embryos. Some are used to implant in the womb, but many of them go in the freezer. 400,000, in fact, is what the Rand Corporation found. And we hear this phrase that, well, they're just going to be thrown away by the thousands every day, so let's get some good out of it. A good utilitarian logic, let's kill them instead for experiments. Except when they did the survey, they found that most of those embryos aren't being thrown away at all. The vast majority of the parents want to keep for what they call family building. Those are their children. And even though they might be in the little frozen orphanage there, they don't want them thrown away. So very few of those embryos are actually available for research. And when the scientists were asked, well, how many would you really need for this research? It was far more than were available. Hundreds of thousands or millions were what they said they would need. I do want to use this picture as well because I think it makes a good point. Uh, there's a, a group that allows adoption of frozen embryos called snowflakes in the US. And this couple had adopted a couple of frozen embryos. Lucinda's holding up a picture under the microscope of those embryos, and here's Luke and Mark a few months later. There is a real connection. These are the same individuals here, sort of a before and after picture. Let's talk about cloning a little bit as well. This is the science fiction view. You're not gonna walk down the street and meet yourself. When we talk about cloning, we're talking about starting with an embryo again. Now at the top here, this is the old fashioned way to make an embryo, an egg and a sperm get together, we call it fertilization. And you now have a single celled embryo, which we all know can go ahead and grow and develop. For cloning, there is a technical term, but you need to remember this term because they may not use the term cloning in the debates. The scientific term is somatic cell nuclear transfer. What you ought to think is every time you hear somatic cell nuclear transfer, think cloning. <laughs> but it also describes the process. Somatic cell, it's just a skin cell, a body cell. So you take a somatic cell and you transfer its nucleus, its chromosomes, into an egg cell that has had its chromosomes removed. But what do you get? You get that same single-celled embryo, and you can't tell the difference under the microscope or with DNA tests between the one made the old-fashioned way with egg and sperm and this new way to make an embryo using somatic cell nuclear transfer cloning. James Thompson again, Mr. Human Embryonic Stem Cell. And in this interview by MSNBC back in 2005, the interviewer was leading them along basically saying, well, you know, people that use this nuclear transfer cloning generally say it's optimized for making stem cells instead of babies, and they don't want to say it's the same thing, you know, if you're using it for stem cells, it's not really an embryo. Well, he stopped the interviewer and just said, see, you're trying to define it away. And it doesn't work. If you create an embryo by nuclear transfer, cloning, and you give it to somebody who didn't know where it came from, there'd be no test you could do on that embryo to say where it came from. It is what it is. But the telling point here at the end, if you try to define it away, you're being disingenuous. And again, that 
process of somatic cell nuclear transfer. Thank you. That's how you got Dolly the clone sheep and all those clone cats and rats and mice you hear about. They took a sheep egg and took out its chromosomes, transferred the chromosomes from a body cell of this other sheep. You've got a cloned sheep embryo. And then if you put it in the womb of this surrogate mother, hello Dolly, you're after a live born clone. Some people call that reproductive cloning because you're after the live born clone. But if you took the exact same embryo and you break it apart to harvest its cells, kind of like harvesting a crop to put them in a dish for experiments, some people will say, well, that's therapeutic cloning and it's different. But it's the same embryo. And as Dr. Thompson said, it's an embryo. The same thing, whether you put it in the womb or you put it in the dish. The other thing about therapeutic cloning is it's a misnomer. It's not therapeutic for the embryo because the embryo dies and there are no therapies from therapeutic cloning. Now, some people have said, well, we can't make it work from the dish, so why don't we try just growing the clones for a while? They've actually done experiments with animals to see if they could do that. They cloned this calf, got the cloned calf embryo, put it in the womb of this cow, and then just aborted the little clone a few months later to get little tiny already formed tissue. It's what some people call fetus farming. And you might think, this is science fiction. They'd never do that. Except they've already done it with animals, kind of set up the paradigm of how they would do it and how long to grow the clone to get different organs. And in fact, in my country, in the state of New Jersey, they passed a law that says it's legal to clone a human embryo and grow it up to the point of birth. And as long as you harvest the organs before the clone is born, you're within New Jersey law. Now, the other thing we need to point out is maybe you have to grow the clone a little farther. Now, if you can't see his sign, it says spare parts, but just look at the look on this guy's face. Clone would have to give up his organs to this guy. Okay, but it's not science fiction anymore because they've already been working on well, how long would you grow the clone. Eggs, you need eggs, remember, because you take my skin cell and put its DNA into an egg cell to start the embryo. It's a health risk to women because you need lots and lots and lots of eggs. The best estimate is at least 100 eggs for every person that you would clone and get one dish of cells because it's so inefficient. So if you do a little math, there are about 17 million diabetes patients in my country times 100 eggs per patient is 1.7 billion human eggs. And that's just one disease group in one country. We're not talking about all the other patients that might need this if you could ever get it to work. You might have heard, in fact, uh, about the South Korean scientist who claimed he had cloned human embryos, who claimed he'd gotten these cells, and then they found it was all a fraud. The only thing he cloned were pictures of somebody else's cells, but he still solicited donations of eggs from women, risked their health because the high doses of hormones does cause problems for the woman. And in fact, 25% of those women suffered health problems. They usually look at that and say, in fact, well, it could be lower, maybe up to 10%, but you experience problems from the high doses of hormones like pain, hospitalization, kidney failure, future infertility, even death. Yes, some women have died from the high doses of hormones just to get enough eggs to harvest for experiments. Calipapodemus calls herself a survivor. She signed up to take the hormone injections and donate eggs, and they just shipped the hormones to her home and really didn't have a doctor supervise it, so she started the injections, like they told her. First day, second day, started to have some problems, big headaches. After the third day, she passed out and woke up a few weeks later in the hospital. And as they discovered, she now has various problems, including she is now infertile. She has to watch for future tumor formation. And in her words, there's a dead zone in my brain. She's one of the lucky ones. Well, if human eggs are hard to get, what would they do if they wanted to clone? Well, the next step was, Let's use animal eggs. In fact, 
Over here across the Irish Sea, the UK has approved licenses to clone, but using animal eggs. You use cow eggs or rabbit eggs with human DNA. I think if you use a cow egg and human DNA, you get a cowboy. <laughs> but the fancy term is chimera, but think of you know animal-human hybrids. They have actually given out licenses now in the UK to start these experiments. It just keeps going and going and going. I want to talk a little bit of ethics here in terms of the science. Let's go back a few years to the Nuremberg Code. And I especially like this line here. No experiment should be conducted where there's an a priori reason to believe that death or disabling injury will occur, except perhaps in those experiments where the experimental physicians also serve as subjects. Good rule to live by, maybe, for these experiments. Of course, the real question is, what does it mean to be human in terms of who counts? When we say this is a human being, this is a person, when it means to be human, are you valued? And of course, we're looking at that question now. I do like this cartoon because I think it frames what we usually hear in the embryonic stem cell debate. Guy on the cloud here on the left, I died waiting for embryonic stem cell research to find a cure. What about you? Guy on the right, I was the embryo. But isn't that what you're usually given as a choice? Well, you can let those patients die, or we can kill these embryos and we'll come up with all those fabulous cures. Well, there are other alternatives even besides those. In fact, in my own country, back under President Clinton in 1999, their Bioethics Commission looked at this question and said, well, in our judgment, Taking stem cells from embryos that are the so-called spares or leftovers from fertility treatments is justifiable only if no less morally problematic alternatives are available for advancing the research. And at that point in time, 10 years ago, they said, well, there really isn't anything else. You're going to have to use these embryos. Well, but that's not really true. There are other alternatives. 